Welcome to Law Sessions. I am Jennifer Hausen. In this law session, relating to uh, English legal system and in particular criminal justice process, we will of course review the criminal justice process and consider what exactly that entails. Now, when we speak of the criminal justice process, it tends to cover two primary areas, models of criminal justice and miscarriages of justice. However, it does also include juries, but we will not cover juries within this law session. It has its own separate law session by itself. So there is a separate law session specifically on juries, and I would urge you to have a look at it. In this law session, as it relates to the criminal justice process, of course, we will look at the models, and of course, we'll look at miscarriages of justice. Now, the types of questions that you should bear in mind when you're looking at the models as well as miscarriage of justice include various things. And the sort of things that I want you to be directing your minds to include things like what is the distinction between the crime control model of criminal justice and the due process model of criminal justice. Also, what type of miscarriage of justice is associated with each model? What were the main causes of some of the most notorious miscarriages of justice within the UK? What were the terms of reference of the Royal Commission on Criminal Justice, which was chaired by Lord Runciman? And what were the main recommendations made to ensure that persons were, that persons were innocent were actually acquitted? Equally, what were any of the recommendations which were implemented and when for example you're looking at the criminal cases review commission what is it and what does it entail why was it introduced what are the strengths and weaknesses what were the main recommendations made by the royal commission to ensure that guilty people do not evade conviction and these are the types of questions that you need to bear in mind when you consider the whole context of criminal justice because when you consider for example the recommendations that have been made by the various commissions are the recommendations compatible with uh, for example issues relating to miscarriages of justice what issues were raised by the inquiries for example in the Stevens Lawrence inquiry when you looked at the investigation of the murder of Stephen Lawrence how has this affected things like the double jeopardy rule and are there arguments, for example, that it should be abolished, were they substantiated, and of course, are there arguments to retain it? Because the danger sometimes is that uh, the state may act on a knee-jerk reaction, for example, when it looks at what the wave of public opinion is. So something may be abhorrent to the public, and as such, we then get legislation coming out of that. But is that the best way to legislate, especially when you're looking at the criminal justice system? For example, uh, when you consider things like a person's uh, liberty being at stake. Well, let's start off with looking at the nature of the criminal justice process. Well, there are different conflicting perspectives as it relates to uh, the criminal law and its role uh, in society, so you have got this conflict when you look at law and society. Because there are uh, approaches to it, for example, you look at whether it provides a medium through which to express uh, conceptions of right and wrong. So when you look at society, how does it see law? Is it a medium for assessing uh, the concepts of right and wrong? Does it regulate behavior in a pro-social way? So the way you're supposed to act, that is what needs regulating as far as society is concerned. You need to state what is considered antisocial, what is harmful in order to require the state, uh, for example, to sponsor punishment of that type of behavior. And when you look at the criminal law, is it that it must provide, for example, penal sanctions which are then backed by uh, state power. So what you have is people who break the law, uh, for example, are penalized. When you look at the objectives of the criminal justice process, it does appear to provide 
a paradox. Because firstly, you have this multi-layered uh, framework which contains, for example, conflicts and competing policies. Because on the one hand, you want to ensure, for example, that human rights is respected. But on the other, you have to ensure that there's a penal sanction, which for all intents and purposes means that it is effective and that the person won't do it again. So you may, of course, have to take its liberty of him, uh, for, for example, uh, as a penal sanction. But then there is human rights, uh, right to liberty and so on. So you need to look at uh, these competing and conflicting policy and, and interests. Now, the paradox, of course, comes in equally where you look at the application of force, which is violence, when you're telling somebody else or you're telling the public that you shouldn't be violent towards someone. Again, the fact that you're depriving somebody of their liberty, and then you're looking at that being uh, contravening, for example, some sort of uh, human rights. So when you look at it, how do you achieve the balance? Well, you need to consider the boundaries that have changed over time. You need to look at the agencies and the actors to see if there needs to be certain regulation of the state actors. Now, there are three main parts to the criminal justice system. There are uh, the law enforcement uh, uh, framework. So you have the law enforcement officers, the police. Secondly, there's the adju adjudication aspect of it. You're looking at the courts. And thirdly, of course, corrections, where you have the jails, the prisons, the probation uh, and parole services. Now, you must take on board uh, the agencies and the actors, of course, who are the police, uh, the Crown Prosecution Service, the Inland Revenue, Serious Fraud Office, the courts, as I say, the various commissions. Uh, and certainly at the uh, bottom rung, you'll see uh, victim and witness care and victim services, for example. Now, one of the things that has been considered when you look at these competing interests is the idea of cost and reform. Now, whenever persons look at the criminal justice system, a lot of times there is some degree of, uh, I wouldn't say anger, but uh, the, it, it is certain, certainly begrudged in paying money, for example, to, uh, for legal aid, where you're looking at uh, criminals. Now, one of the things that we see a lot of times being brought to the fore, particularly in the political arena, is this idea of cost. Now, when you look at the considerable amount of monies being paid out of public funds, so for example, in 2002, approximately two billion pounds uh, was uh, paid uh, for policing the uh, prison service, legal aid, the probation service. So when you looked at the criminal justice system, it cost the taxpayer somewhere in the order of two billion pounds. Now, there's always this rhetoric of war against crime that it justifies spending. But what should be the goals of the criminal justice system? Whose interests are served by expansion? How is efficiency judged? Is efficiency judged by putting 100 police officers on the beat? Is efficiency judged by spending uh, on expanding the court system? Or might it be more efficient, for example, to look at ways to uh, assist uh, offenders uh, to turn away from lives of crime, to rehabilitate, for example? It is a hard question to answer because one of the things uh, as a, when you look at change is how is change measured? And by and large, change is measured depending on the view that is held. Because it may very well be that the government starts off with this war on crime only to end up with a huge tax bill, but from year one to year two, there is no change in, for example, the amount of robberies, the amount of murders, the amount of burglaries. And the question then is, We've just spent so much money, why is it the same? So when you look at change sometimes, all of these are really social questions which you need to at least look at empirical evidence in order to be able to assess and respond to. Now, let's move on into looking at perspectives and theories. It's the different types of social theories which, of course, uh, 
uh, and the models, of course, which underpin the criminal justice system. Because the idea is these questions that I've asked are hard questions to answer, but you've got to then contextualize them. Because if we're saying, well, whose interests are being served when we spend all this money, then maybe the answer lies in looking at the theories. Different social theories, different social model argu arguably underpin the criminal justice system. Now, Herbert Packer, who is a Stanford University law professor, constructed two models. He said, when you look at the criminal justice system, you can either look at, it, look at it from the crime control model or the due process model in order to be able to better understand the system because they represent the two competing system of values which operate within a criminal justice system in order to see how a state will approach uh, looking at how, for example, uh, they deal with the system. Now, the tension between the two accounts for the conflict and disharmony that now is uh, observed in the criminal justice system, because when you look, and I'm going to go through them, when you look at the crime control model, the interest it's seeking to protect and preserve may fly in the face of what the due process model requires. Now, once you know what the models are, you will see that by and large, most states have a little of each. So let's look at the crime control model. When you look at it, the crime control model, the effectiveness of that type of model, as it relates to the system, uh, the criminal justice system, is judged by how well it controls and reduces crime. Now, high conviction rate is viewed as evidence of effectiveness. Deterrence and prevention, increased police powers, all of these are what the crime control model looks at. And by and large, the crime control model considers that the ends justifies the means. So when you look at the crime control model, it is quite happy, it is quite satisfied that you convict 10 persons and you keep crime low even if one of those persons is innocent so if you get nine guilty men out of ten then you know we really feel sorry for the innocent one but that's it means that crime is vastly reduced now it's interesting because whenever I run an exercise which I normally say to students if you have a situation where if you arrested 10 people and crime would be reduced by say 90 percent but within that 10 there is one innocent person would you be happy and would you be satisfied with yourself that that innocent person will go to jail for life and they normally say well yes you know he's sort of like uh, yeah it's the fallout he is the casualty of war then I follow that up by saying, would you volunteer to be that one person who would go to prison for life for the greater good of knowing that there are nine men who, of course, are taken off the streets? And I've never found anyone yet who said, yes, I will be that one man. It's always, yes, as long as it's not me. And that's the problem with the crime control model. High conviction rates, cleaning up of crime, but at what expense? Ends justifying the means. In contrast, when you look at the due process model, it says the effectiveness of the system is judged by the integrity of the participants in the system and the processes of that system. So it says the system needs to be transparent, it needs to have a degree of recognition, it must acknowledge and correct its errors. The persons uh, who are uh, within that jurisdiction must be innocent until proven guilty. The state must bear the burden of proof and there is a high standard of proof when it comes to that. Trial by jury is important. So when you look at the due process model, it comes from the standpoint of saying if 10 people go free because only one of them in that group is innocent, then justice will have been done if, for example, the state actors have not done what they were supposed to do. So let's consider, for example, let's go to the, for those of you who can remember the OJ case.
the criminal case that is not the civil case. When you look at the OJ case, which is a big celebrated case in America, we see that um, the idea of the state actor, the police, Mark Furman, uh, basically apparently tampering with the evidence meant that the due process model is engaged. The idea being that the state actors and the processes must be above reproach. The idea then is that when you look at the theories of criminal justice, it gives you some idea as to how the system is driven. Now that we've gone through uh, that awkward uh, first segment, I want us to take a short break and when we come back, we will really go into the meat of looking at uh, the criminal justice system in some more depth and certainly uh, expanding on uh, the models and then of course moving on and looking at, for example, uh, situations where there has been a miscarriage of justice immediately after this break. <laughs> 